I'm Cassandra with Profit Guru, and I've been selling on Amazon since 2021. Uh, Justin, the winds of change, and I've been selling on Amazon since 2012. Hi, I'm Doug Moore. I've been selling on Amazon since 2021. I feel like it's like the football game, how like the people like show up. They're like, I'm from Texas A&M. <laughs> I was thinking like Alcoholics Anonymous, but. <laughs> That's true. I haven't okay. clicked on my Amazon page in 12 minutes. That's right. I haven't checked the app in, in a minute and a half. Yeah, I haven't checked, re refreshed my sales in three minutes. <laughs> It's funny because sometimes I'm like, if my sales are off, like it'd be like uh, the other day, actually today, it was like almost like 1230 in the afternoon before I got a sale. And I'm like checking all my emails. Like, did they send me something saying I've been kicked off? Like what's what's happening <laughs> if they put some sort of block on it? Yeah, yeah. I've, had, I've had that happen twice where it it's like you actually think you're just having a, a bad sales day and you don't realize that, you, you know, take care hold of. on your account or. It happened to me with a shipment once. I didn't know that the box couldn't exceed like such like the 25 or whatever it is mm. on each side. Yeah. And I sent one in that was way too big. It was like a huge box. So I wasn't getting any sales and I didn't find out until I tried to upload more inventory like the next week that everything yeah. was like, nope, you need to acknowledge what you did and not ever do it again. We could talk about like different ways that we source FBA, FBM. You were doing a lot of FBM, weren't you, Justin? Like, didn't you just show something you went to Kohl's? And got like a killer deal or something oh yeah so uh, well I went, I went to kohl's um they're having their i think it's nationwide they're having their 50 percent off their clearance sale right now oh and i didn't know that spent, i think i just i spent like 1500 dollars on like 60 pair of shoes which equals out to about i don't know 25 dollars a piece or something um i'm gonna send those in fba though but i got some really i mean like some really good like shoes that have been out of stock for a while but were still selling really well when they were in stock for like 23 dollars and the sale price is like 80 or 90. And I mean, it worked out pretty well this time. I usually usually hit or miss with it, but um, FBM, I just recently got a bunch of um, limited edition Oreo cookies. Interesting. Are they like Dunk or Galaxy? My daughter was just telling me about some new Oreos. They were, um, I'm assuming they were for like, the, just like the Christmas season. They're complete. okay, so they're, ap they're actually mm -hmm. like phenomenal. They're an Oreo cookie completely wrapped in white chocolate. Ooh. I downed about 15 of them before I realized they were 100 calories a piece. <laughs> oh my God. I, so I, I did something similar once where I, uh, I, I had a bunch of cookies that were expired and I didn't realize that they, they didn't, you know, they didn't fit in the expiration window that I needed to have them in for Amazon. Yeah. So I was like, I might as well eat them. Yeah. And I had, you know, I had like triple the amount of cookies I normally would have. I mean, you don't want to be wasteful. <laughs> no. No, then it's like, no wonder people buy these things, man. I saw you post actually something about cookies on Instagram, didn't you? Yeah. It like was, it was having too much. Uh, yeah. It was sort of sketchy because the, well, the expiration date, you can be a lot closer to what Amazon recommends if you do it fulfilled by merchant. Right. So like these things expired in like mid April, but I've sold like, like 65, four packs and uh, haven't had any, any complaints from them. I th I sort of bank on the fact that if they're limited like that, like like the company probably made them at a certain date. And so anywhere you get them now is going to have that that date on there. But yeah. uh, it's a risk like everything else, I guess, you know. That's actually a really good tip if we come, if we circle back to this. Switching to FBM for that, if, if you have an item that's unexpectedly close to, you know, you're not going to be able to send it in. FBM if your traditional model is FBA. Yeah, that's why it's good to know like all the different ways, even though I don't really like to FBM, like you know how for cases like this when you have to be able to do it. Oh, it was horrible. I mean, it was like I would get home from work at like four o'clock and, and box up Oreo cookies for like two hours. Like it takes a long time to box st like stuff up, especially if it's not a single product. Like if you have one product and you can say, okay, I'm going to pack it this way every single time, that's a lot different than I got to find a box in my basement for a three pack because it doesn't fit in, you know, the normal size boxes or whatever. It takes, takes time to do all the crap. I hate it, but it's money I'd miss out on otherwise. That could go well into talking about prepping. I'm sure you had to use like a ton of bubble wrap for those. I don't, I don't like stuff that can break easily because customers will complain so bad. Like, even though you're going to bite that cookie in half and break it yeah. anyways, like if it's broken in half, they could leave you negative re feedback. 
just yeah. for that. So it's kind of like risky. What happened to me on one of them? The, the the first few that I sent, I didn't have boxes for. So I put four box cookies inside of a, a bubble mailer and then inside of a poly bag. And I was like, yeah, we'll, you know, see if it gets there. And I did that for like, I think six of them and five of them made it okay. And one person said they were crushed. So I, I ended up giving them like 50% refund or something. Yeah, I was selling uh, glass jars of jam. I don't remember who it was through for a while. And I think there were some just general high volume of returns because it's broken yeah. jars. But I think on top of that, I just can't stand if a product takes a long time to prep. Mm -hmm. Like I want to do, you know, 100, 200 items. If I'm, if I'm selling arbitrage, I want to do it, you know, in a very short amount of time. Yep. And if I have to go through that and I don't have a really good system, I, I never really kind of got to a point where I had a really good bubble wrap, you know, system. Same. And certain things I'll avoid altogether for FBM. I don't really like doing glass and that kind of stuff. But uh, some people I talk to, I have sold different things that really opened me up to like, oh, maybe I can like finding drinks like monster drinks or something like that and selling them in a 12 pack. I'm like, that's a pain, right? Because you got to put 12 of them in a box and it's yeah not original packaging, but at the same time, you know, you're making $35 on it profit. So it's like, eh, yeah, you know, no, I know that. I think that's the one we're actually stuck to. I would take the the time um, for, it was ghost energy drinks, get a giant, you know, 24 pack or 12 pack or whatever, and then, and then bundle them. But then you'd have to wrap them up and whatnot. And it was worth it to take the time with those. I found that anything over like two pounds, it would just kill me in shipping. I'd always try to like cover the shipping to like get more sales. But if it was more than two or three pounds, the shipping would just be, take all the profit away. Well, when you roll the dice, right? Because you're all the way. I mean, we're, we're in the Midwest mm -hmm. and you're over on the East Coast. So anywhere right. like California, Washington, you know, it's like, I think I, I posted something the other day. I sold like 10 of the same item, right? Same exact thing, same packaging, $5, $6, $5, $5. And then it was like $11.89. Cause it went to the West coast and I'm like, yeah. that's a huge, that's almost like, you know, five, $6 that you're taking a hit on just because, you know, it's, I mean, you can't, I mean, I, I don't know a way around it. You almost have to offer free shipping to sort of stay competitive, but uh, it definitely sucks when you're like, okay, I've got 20 of these items. And then 18 people in California decide that they want them. Oh, nope, no profit for me. <laughs> okay. yeah, profit in half. Where'd you get the ghost? Was it off of that Vita cost? Cause I was getting a lot of stuff off I of that. I think I did for, for, for quite a while. I, I would, I would always rotate for like whoever was having, you know, the, the deal, you know, you find, you find the product that sells well. And then if you know the multiple stores that sell it and you just look for their, you know, their random, we're overstocked, we need to sell and you get a 20% coupon. And then the next day you go to the, the other store and they've got a, a discount, you know, yeah, I think yeah. I would normally offset the uh, shipping as well with, I would try to find really light products to go with the really heavy ones, just so I could feel better about my overall, you know, the amount of products being sent per box. For some reason, I just had this mental thing where I had to have X number of products per box. That oh, I you were sending, you were sending them in to Amazon then doing them FBA? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would, and I would just find a lot of light I would balance my boxes. Do the same thing I was, I was doing it this morning. I think it makes sense, right? Because I mean, if you're shipping cans of anything, 12 packs or anything, it's going to be heavy. You can only send in 50 pounds, you know, so if you can get four in there and you're making, you know, $30 on each one with $120 minus your shipping, where it's like, that would still be okay, I guess. But if you can get some yeah. light in there and make that 120 up to 300, <laughs> feel a little bit better about it. Yeah. Yeah. Anything about sourcing? Any secrets to share there? I was just watching, I forgot her name, but she was saying she does like bundles too. Like I do a lot of bundles. She just goes like on Google and puts in like trade shows near me. It doesn't even have to be like a trade show near you. And then you just look at like the directory of all of the different um, suppliers and people that way. That was really interesting. I'm going to that later on tonight is just start looking. I really thought to do that. I know the one in Las Vegas that they do one through there where you just kind of see like all the exhibitors it's like a lot of potential to just uh was let me see dallas dallas market center.com check that out for finding like new products to put in the bundles but it's cool because we all kind of do something different Austin does mostly um arbitrage right so doug you're kind of like out of the arbitrage game you or are you still doing a little bit or just kind of 
off-brand stuff? I started retail and then I did, I shifted heavy to online probably a year and a half just because of time. I just didn't have the time to find the good deals that you could if you, if you went into the store. I just wanted to, you know, spend as little time as I could as my side hustle. And I mainly used, and I think I shared this with you a while ago, Fast Track FBA. For me, that was just a really good, like, I think just reasonably sourced leads because obviously there's a bunch of gimmicky leads out there, but I just felt they were the most reliable for me. And I probably used them for six or nine months. Um, and I think it was a hundred dollars a month. I could get a ton more than I would kind of anywhere else. I liked that. It was really cool. Like you to buy leads and it kind of showed you like the ROI and how much the product cost. Got scammed on um, one site was selling dog treats and I purchased like hundreds of dollars in dog treats, never sent it, but I paid through PayPal, which is awesome to pay through PayPal because then you can file those claims and most of the time you get your money back. It was for online ar arbitrage, <clears throat> you had a leads list for uh, online? Kind of like a leads list, yeah. Like you would pick the category and then it kind of would give you like a teaser about it. Like it would show you the stats on it and how much you're buying it for. Um, so then it, it's like a blind thing. You don't know what the product is. Oh, so right. They'll give you the keep a graph on it and, and you can, you, you can see how it's performing. Yeah. It's a blind bag. Yep. Then you, then you open it up and, and it's only available to like 10 people and then they remove it and then they just, they have a, a bunch of people sourcing leads. They just, you know, work through subscriptions, but it was, it just removed me from the headache of spending a lot of time sourcing. Cause I just shifted away from trying to find, I, I obviously used a lot of different things to source over time, but that was just the best way for me to spend my time in a limited way was fast track FBA. It would be bad. Like you'd click on it and you're like, oh, I want to take that back. But it would let you too. Like if you didn't like that lead, sometimes it would like, it would let you cant it and it would give you like the, the money back. Yeah. I never, I never had an issue where I just said, like, especially if uh, you end up were gated, that was the biggest thing, right? Like if you yeah. were, if you opened up the product and you thought you were ungated and it turns out you weren't, they would just refund you the tokens and you could use it for something else. Oh, nice. Yeah, that, that's one of the first things that came to my mind. I was like, oh, hey, this is a good lead. And you're like, oh yeah, maybe for everybody who's not gated, it might be a good lead. Yeah. No, I, I would say I would probably, I probably actually used half of the leads that I bought and it was worth it for me for that time concept that could be like a really good business model your business like the people who develop that they're probably making bank off of it oh yeah i, I imagine you'd be able to do a lot of hands off like i think a lot I of people know. when they do their leads list they, they get like their um you know somebody like in the philippines or something yep. virtual assistant yep. yeah virtual assistant things and you pay them however much you agree upon and give them your parameters and they send them to you and after a while you just vet the ones who really put the work in and then you're, you're pretty much just Putting heck, you could even outsource the whole programming of everything. I did yeah. dabble a bit into for sourcing, um, into storefront stocking, you know, and like Profit Guru is good with that, you know. I didn't spend a lot of time doing that, but it, it was certainly a good way when I was running out of leads for a given month. I got better at that over time, but it, it took some practice to really understand what you should look for where it's not wasting your time. What do you do now? I switched in early 2023 to private label. I was probably kind of hovering the two yeah. for the last half of 2022, meaning I was doing research and development on the private label, but I didn't launch anything until 2023. And now I'm kind of all in on a brand. I've stepped away from, from arbitrage. It's always kind of something that I like to know is there you know, as an option. For whatever reason, this doesn't go the way I want it to, or if I'm looking for extra cash, I know I that's something I can always do again. It's nice to kind of be shifted away from a bunch of packages showing up at my house. I do have a few boxes behind me because I'm trying to save money on Amazon storage, but I don't have to uh, deal with repackaging anymore, which is quite nice. I've tried to do online arbitrage and I, I like the model. And when I hear people talk about it, I'm like, that sounds amazing. But then when I actually sit down and do the work, I'm like, this is, I'm bored out of my <laughs> coupons and trying to get discounts and trying to stack them. And then I was like, I'm just going to sign up when people have dis discounts and then your email gets flooded. And then I'm like, I found some good things and then it tanked because everybody else found them, which you still have with retail arbitrage or, yeah. or anything really too. But it, I just, I guess I just like didn't enjoy it. Right. Like that didn't make it stick. Everything sounds good, but I didn't like like the process of it. And it may sound weird because some people may be like, hey, it sounds like yesterday, <clears throat> I was like, oh, I'm gonna go to Kohl's real quick, you know, and see if they have anything. I didn't realize to come into, they had so much good stuff, right? 
But then it was like, okay, now let's go to another one. So you end up being out instead of an hour. Now it's four, four or five hours you yeah. know, driving around. And it yeah. takes the whole day. Now, is it going to pay off in the end? I mean, yeah, it's you know, but it's just that's sort of how retail arbitrage is. You know, you sort of yeah. got to get it while while it's there. And I see how that can turn a lot of people off too. It's a lot of footwork, depending on what kind of stuff you're sourcing and in, in in your local area too. You know, like if I, I get a majority of my stuff from a couple stores. And so I was like, if I lived somewhere where they didn't have something like that, you know, my method would probably be very, very different. Why I can't do um, retail arbitrage because I have nothing here. We have Walmart, Dollar General, like that's about it. I could go into the stores and like have those ones like you and Rob do like those little like kind of like secret stores, but a screw being like where I am in upstate New York, I don't have the option. I remember I lived in a town of, I mean, it was like 14,000 people. And I started doing this there. Well, I started doing it in a little bit bigger town, like 40,000. Then I moved and there was like 14,000 people in this town. It was not big at all. They've got like a Walmart, a Kroger, the, the one and only steakhouse, the one and only ice cream joint. People, I would hear people on YouTube like, oh, it doesn't matter where you live at. It doesn't matter your location. And I'm like, I, like, I understand using your location as, uh, as a crutch, but if you're uh, like a YouTuber who gets all of your stuff from Ross and the closest Ross to you is like an hour and 20 minutes away. You, it, location does matter. Definitely. Yeah, I don't even know where, where Ross would be. <laughs> I don't have one of those. I'm the exact opposite you, Justin. Like I just, I didn't find the joy. I hated the idea of going into a store for an hour and potentially walking out with nothing. Same. That, that was just something that I could see why people would find it interesting. The good way of getting out and you know, whatever. But for me, that was just, ugh. Time I did it, I uh, was in Ollie's. We do have an Ollie's, but there's never really anything good there. Like all the grocery stuff is about to expire. And I was actually filming, which I'm already embarrassed to do. Like people are like staring at me like, okay, what are you doing? And then one of my <laughs> students is like coming by the aisle. She's like, hi, Mrs. Barney. I'm like, hi. Oh yeah. Awful. Just well, awful. I, I had all my students. I had all my students subscribe to my channel. I was like, "You guys need to go in there." Okay, we're gonna take the next ten minutes, and everybody's gonna. No, <laughs> they knew that, and some of them are, I haven't taught in six years, and the kids are already graduated, and they're still comment. You know, but yeah, it's it's definitely. Um, I, I don't know, and like I said, it'd be different if it was somewhere else. But for me, like the couple stores that I go to, I know all the managers first name basis, you know, and, and there's, there's That's like perfect. five of them that I go to regularly walk in. They know who I am. They know who my wife is. I've got their no phone numbers. You know, I text them, Hey, I'm looking for this. They'll, sometimes they'll hold it. And it's just, I've established building those relationships with those people. So it's really nice to be able, you know, to be able to do that. Uh, for me, like retail arbitrage is one of the least scalable models. I think it depends on what your goals are for reselling, right? Like I, I say that, like for me, I don't have any intentions of being this scaling to this huge, massive Amazon seller. Like, like personally, I like my regular job, my 401k and my insurance, the steadiness, but Amazon really... It helps me get a lot of stuff that I wouldn't be able to otherwise, you know, more savings, uh, you know, just whatever your fun money is and just to, you know, to get that extra income. It, it pretty much what I make on Amazon pretty much doubles my salary from where I'm at. So it's, it's sort of cool yeah. because I put in a lot less time in Amazon than I do, you know, my regular job. But for me, like that, that's okay for me, right? Like I don't want to put doing retail arbitrage, all my eggs into the Amazon basket, because unless you're private label or working with a direct brand or something like that, I mean, Amazon could come across tomorrow and be like, yep, yeah, those orders done. were expired. So we're going to shut you down after, yeah. you know, 12 years of selling without incident. That's a little extreme, but you hear about that stuff. Every time I get an email from Amazon, I'm like, oh God, I hope this isn't the day. Are they shutting me down? Like it's yeah. nerve wracking. You can't go all in on it for arbitrage. With Doug, yeah. you have your brand you can fall back on. You could go, you know, you have your own website. That's, that was the biggest thing that pushed me over the, over the line into private label was because I was trying to, I had a five-year plan when I started the business, which was to give me an option. If I wanted to leave my full-time job, I could. I think when I was trying to scale up a ton, that was another reason why online worked for me because I could find a ton of stuff through leads in a short period of time. Um, and then I was trying to get, you know, I had a prep center and everything and told the story about how I've almost got 
got shut down just because of a few stupid, you know, there was like a counterfeit or whatever issue. And then there was some enough red flags where they were holding my money and I just really scared me. If you've got 500 leads that you're, you know, you're turning into buys every month or whatever it was, you're going to make a mistake somewhere. You have too many of those. Really hurt you. Yeah, that's probably the worst. I, I, I don't even remember the guy's name, but um, he was doing, I think like 200,000 a year or something in sales on Amazon. We're doing it for like five years. And then he got, like, he got shut down. And I'm watching like this, like, you know, like it's a horror movie. I'm like, yeah. okay. yes. so one, one of the things though, is, is like, you never know what people say in what actually happened. You never really know, right? You got Amazon's story, you got their story, you got the truth, right? And so this guy was like, even got a lawyer. And then it was like six, seven, eight, nine months. It was a long process going back and forth. And uh, he looks back on it and he, he said, I wonder if I just would have accepted that I did it wrong, wrote a plan of action and moved on. But he tried to, he tried to fight it is what he tried to do. But the fear of doing everything you think right, but oh, I didn't read that policy that says the boxes have to be under 25 inches. You know, like right. you send it in and they're like, oh, well, you know, you're not suited for our platform. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you need to know all the rules. Yeah, maybe this falls under the, the we're getting into a little bit of the frustration stuff. But even with the whole uh, plan of action, have, have you had to either you had to deal with that before? Or, On a short like, scale, just with the 25 inch with the boxes, I had to like acknowledge that and make it known. Like, I understand now and let them know, like, OK, this my boxes can't exceed this. Not to your length. You had like a different issue with the um, authenticity, right? Yeah. Well, even beyond that, I mean, I had a couple of other, you know, I think I had one scenario where I was, I didn't see that it was a, a bundle of two and I only sent in a single, you know, uh -huh. some, something like that, you know? And, and so, like I said, when you start, when you're trying to scale and you're going through, like, I was just trying like a machine, you know, I was one getting, I, had a web center, I was just trying to get things as fast as I could order and use my credit card and then get money back. You know, that's what I was doing. That plan of action is hard to like figure out what, what they want. I, I think I went through like five iterations of slightly different things and it was just one sentence was a little different and they finally were like, okay. And the way Amazon is like, even with the ungating process. I was just thinking you, that. You could have probably sent that same letter, literally the same letter five times. And then on the fifth time, they're like, oh yeah, no, this is good. This is what we're looking for. Yeah. I mean, if you call customer service, they're absolutely useless. Yeah. Yep. Like number one frustration right there for me. The scariest part about customer service is you're like, hey, is this okay to do this? Don't ever call customer service and ask them if you're in accordance yeah, with no. any policy on Amazon. Yeah. Ever. You think yeah. they'd be able to help? They do not. And they could tell you, yes, this is okay. And then Amazon could be like, that wasn't okay. Why would you think that's <laughs> My biggest frustration is like, I'm a black or white person. And with Amazon, it's like, it's so gray, especially with like on gating, I could put um, an invoice from Kohl's and get approved and on gated. And then another person can do it the same day and it's rejected. Like, and there's no answer for it. People would be like, how come it doesn't work for me? I'm like, I don't know. It's just part of the game. It's a gray game. It's gray, but it's always your fault. Oh, yeah. The biggest gray area that, that sticks with me and a couple of other people that I've been talking to is expired complaints. And so Amazon's pretty clear about supplements, right? You have to have, you know, whatever the supply is. If you have a 90 day supply, it has to be 90 days plus, I think it's like 90 days or 120. One of the, so it's like, it's like the amount that you have plus 90 days, you can send it in, right? They have zero things for food. So if you have something that expires in eight months, and somebody says, there's no way I can eat all these in eight months. It could be, you know, a, one pack of uh, chips and they could be like, nobody's going to eat this in eight months. There's nothing on Amazon to say that's acceptable or that's not acceptable. And Amazon is always going to be like, you're the seller. You're going to have to take the, take the hit for it. That's super frustrating. We just sold mm -hmm. some, a couple of people in this group that I'm in, we just sold some um, cold medicine, right? And there was 56 tablets of cold medicine. And it says take three a day. So you're talking, that's what, like three weeks almost worth of medicine. It expires in six months. And they were like, I can't take all this before <laughs> six months is up. And I'm like, what are you like stocking for the end of the world? Like, how are you like, are you not sick right now? You know, but you can't make those arguments to people with yeah. customers. You know, you got a good customer service, but I just wish that it wouldn't affect your account. Like with private label, like if I owned my own stuff and I was like, hey, you know what? I'm sorry about that. Here's your money back. Here's a new product or whatever. No big deal. 
you're responsible to yourself, like through your own platform or whatever, but on Amazon, Amazon could be like, yep, no. Nope. <laughs> yeah, did you, did either you have um, frustrations when you first started about expired dates and even just figuring out how to interpret packaging? Um... Oh, dude, I, I don't want to say I lie. I'm not lying. But if I get a bottle of conditioner that has no expiration date on it, I used to be like, okay, I need to call the manufacturer. <laughs> right? Or, you know, what what the batch code is and all this kind of stuff. And yes, it was very frustrating. But now if I get a, if I get some conditioner, I'm just going to put it like two years out. Yeah, I started to do the same thing. Yeah. With, makeup if you makeup don't really doesn't know. have expiration. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the annoying part. They require it, you know. But, but I remember when I first started, though, you know, panicking, like like you said, like, how do, how do, what do I do? How do I interpret this? How strict is this? Am I going to mm -hmm. have a cop show up? You know, yeah. like, you know, it's like one of these crazy things, you know, you like to fear. And, and then they're like, your font must be a particular size and it must be this. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I just print it off on my one by two label, whatever inventory yeah. lab size prints it out. I don't think it's the font that they're wanting, but it's never been like an issue. Another frustration is warehouses are so different. Like I'll have a friend who's like, oh, I just sent my package in. And then like two days later, it's in their inventory. I'm like, what? I send my package. I'll be aware that they received it and they're not even counting it in yet until like the next week. And then mm -hmm. they're not showing up. It's showing like 80 units out of hundred are counted in, but they're not in my inventory yet. Use my prep center. That warehouse is a lot faster. Why is the one next to me so slow and the other one is faster by weeks. And that doesn't make sense. I, I think it probably just has to do with workforce and employment, you know, honestly at the individual places uh, I would think. And the time of the year too. When it gets closer to the holidays, I feel like oh, yeah. that stuff fits for for a little while. But yeah, yeah. Same with me. There's one warehouse that I send it to, and it's like almost automatic. And then there's another one that I send it to, and it's like okay, it's been three and a half weeks. I love not prepping. That was one of my biggest frustrations. Like I just did not have systems that worked well, and I would keep getting different uh, thermal printers, and they just none of them were working right. It would take me like an hour just to try to set up to get my FN SKU to print on it correctly. It just, I don't know, it was a headache. I hated prepping. I would keep stuff in my room, uh, my storage room for months and just not ever prep it. And then by the time I'd be like, okay, let's prep it now. There was no profit. Like, it, it Yeah, that, that will kill you right there, right? If you sit oh, on your wrong. stuff too long, especially yeah. in the arbitrage world. I will say I've gotten looser with with the uh, standards I hold myself to, mm -hmm. not not necessarily in a bad way. But when I hear about other sellers doing things and they're like, oh, you do that? Like, that's got to take a lot of time. I'm like, right, it does. They're like, I've never done that. And it's always been fine. So I'm like, OK, maybe mm -hmm. I'll try it. Right? Polybagging, right? Some things will say it has to be polybagged. Some things will, will not have that Amazon doesn't recognize it as something that needs polybagged. Say it's a lotion, right? That you pop the top off and squeeze. One lotion will say it needs to be polybagged. Makes sense to me. Another lotion will say that it doesn't need to be polybagged, but it's the same thing. So I'll polybag them, right? But then I started to be like, okay, it doesn't say it. I'm just going to, it's going to send it in. Granted, it doesn't look like it's going to bust all over the place. Well, yeah, that's, that's for sure. I would, I would often just polybag something like a lotion just because even if it didn't require it, just because I didn't, I could just imagine half the time they'd show up in my house. You know, before I was using a prep center, they were our terrible. Yeah, when they send it back to you, they don't have the same standards that they expect you to have. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure. Like push tops, you know what I mean? Like for shampoos with the push tops, those would always break. Every time I would sell those, I would get complaints. Yeah, you're telling, you're reminding me of all the things I don't miss of <laughs> arbitrage. But I will say this, I probably, if I got back into online arbitrage again, I probably would really revamp my own system and and avoid the prep center i like you i didn't like i didn't want to deal with prepping it just it ate so much of my margin the trade-off for me is the sales tax because i send it right to that prep center so i don't have to pay the sales tax that i would be paying the well i was doing that too more. but it just didn't make it up i mean i i'm sure i could have worked it out but i you know i went started using a sales tax free state and send all my stuff, you know, all my online orders were shipped there. I didn't have to pay for the sales tax because in Michigan, we've got six. Still didn't make up for it, but I think mm -hmm. maybe, maybe with more time, it could have worked out. I mean, obviously it's working out for you. Well, like with Justin's, some places want to charge a fee for every small little thing. So it took a lot of research finding one that 
was really just all inclusive. So there wasn't any anything hidden. Like they're not going to charge me for each little piece of bubble wrap for my label for, you know, it's one fee, here it is. I, I would I mean a prep center or something I think would be huge, especially if you if you're if you're um, able to do it arbitrage and stuff like that. And then definitely doing doing the retail arbitrage. You gotta have a process doing it because finding items is the fun part, right? And that's part of the appeal of retail arbitrage. And it's probably one of the highest margin methods that there is. A lot of times wholesale, you, you know, you're doing 20%, 25%, something like that ROI where, you know, you could go out and you come across the good item and, you know, I'm making three, 400 ROI, percent ROI on some things. And then you give up in the, in, in the fact that it's not consistent, right? Like you can't, I can't go back and buy a hundred more of those items. And that's sort of where the, I think where the given, the give and take is, it seems like it's nice having the high margins, that's for sure. Well, I, I think you're highlighting that if, if someone came to me today and asked me, you know, what, you know, what model would you start with? And I always say, well, arbitrage in general, but if, if they wanted to know more specifically online or retail, I'm realizing that I think a lot of it is personality. Yep. You know, as we're talking about this, I think the the method that you should choose is largely based on what do you like to do? Do you like the hunt? Do you like getting out and going to a store? Do you like shopping in general? Or are you trying to free up your time? Are you trying to scale? I think they're very two different things for two different types of people. They both work in just two different ways. Yeah, retail arbitrage is like a treasure hunt. Like I remember when I would try to do it at Walmart, when you come to an end cap of clearance, one time um, it was like last summer, I came to an end cap. It was all name brand, like Keurig coffees marked down for like three or $4. And each of them was like $8 profit. And it, it gives you like a high for the day. Like you're, you're just so excited when you find those types of deals. But like Justin said, it's not there to go back and to replenish. So you have to like constantly be on the hunt. And if that's something people like, then that's probably, you're right. I think personality definitely does have a lot to, a lot to do with it for sure. And I think online arbitrage, you know, more people are, there's some people that are more geared towards coupon hunting and, and, and browsing online to begin with, you know, and it fits right into what they already like to like to do. Mm -hmm. so. I could do it all day. Just sit on my computer and just browse. Like it's not boring for me. I love it. For me, it's like going to the store. I'm like, oh, it's exhausting. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. It's like, I'm so, get me out of the store, please. I don't want lines. I don't want people. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to go down an aisle on a source and then have someone in my way or have, like, I could never even get over, over being watched either. Like, that. Yeah. you want the retail thing, you have to get over the fact that you're a weirdo. Oh, you scanning know, stuff off the shelf. Oh, right. <laughs> why so, don't you wear, why aren't you wearing the, the store's <laughs> uniform? Are you working here? Yeah, they're like, oh, excuse me, sir, could you help me? <laughs> so it's funny, in, in you're right. Um, I, I'm used, I mean, I'm used to it by now, right? I've, I've been doing it a long time. But so yesterday, I got all those shoes. And what's cool about Kohl's, they have to do your tax exempt at the customer service. So the line was like halfway down the store, but I was like, yeah, sorry, I got to go to customer service. Yeah, so there was nobody in line. So we skipped in front of the line and then, and then the people, some of the ladies got behind us and they were like, oh, what are, what are all those shoes for? I was like, well, they're for feet. <laughs> What are you going to do with them? And my wife had a guilty conscience, you know, and she's like, we're going to give them to charity. I'm like, we're not giving them to charity. I was like, <laughs> guilty conscience so she lies. <laughs> right. You know, she's like freaked out. But, but I've had people do that. They're like, oh, um, tax exempt. Okay. Well, bless your heart. Are you with the school district? Mm hmm. I sure am. Myself, you know, and you definitely raise questions. And then, and then you'll be in a weird spot where somebody won't be looking at what you're looking at. But as soon as you have 30 of them in your cart, they're like, oh, are you going to take all those? I'm like, right, because now you think it's something good, right? Definitely being out in public, right? So you got to deal with everything that that, that entails. Got to have a strong backbone. <laughs> but it, sometimes you see other people that are doing it too. And it's like, okay, yes, I, I got your number, buddy. You know, like, but <laughs> I, like for me, anytime I see competition, like whenever it's weird, because whenever I look at what they have, I'm like, why are they even like buying that? You know, because so many people do different things. There's people that go to Ollie's and spend thousands of dollars in books. And I'm like, that's like horrible to me because most of the books and I'm even looking them up and they're banking on like their books selling for like $15 higher than it is now based on the sales there. I'm like, that's just, it just does not sound like a good plan. But in Ollie's, I've, Ollie's is just for some reason in the past, like three or four years, I don't know if it's because of the amount of like attention that it's gotten from like YouTube and other 
social media, but anytime you find something at Ollie's, like it's almost 90% guaranteed to be $30 less than what it was the day you found it. <laughs> it just tank, it just tanks so much. It, it really, yeah, really I don't have to look. No, I found some baby alive dolls there. Like last time I went and I was there for hours scanning the whole store. They're really they're just, there isn't at, as much at Ollie's as it's hyped up to be. Or, and it's or not that I'm not hidden. scanning. Like I'm scanning a ton. It's just, there's no profit. Or, or people, uh, you know, they, they're okay with lower margins. Like I talked to this guy and, uh, well, I talked to him because we were on some listings. Uh, I mean, a couple of my buddies and this, this dude would just keep dropping the price. I'm like, why are you dropping it by like $5 every time? Like, why are you doing that? Like I understand a penny or like 50 cents, which is still annoying. Doesn't really help, but the, you're, you're like tanking. So he sent me these pictures. And so his method to scale was he gets a U-Haul and he goes from Kentucky down to Florida and he hits all of the Ollie's and they make a whole week trip out of it. Him and like some people from his family to fill up multiple like U-Haul trailers. And I'm like, well, what's like, what are the margins you're looking for? He's like, well, I set my minimum to $2. And so I sell through the tank. So if it, if it's, you know, selling for, for uh, 30, I'm willing to go all the way down to 17 and just sell it at that until, until it goes back. I buy so much that I sell through the tank. And I'm like, that sounds like you're part of the problem to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> problem for the rest of us, but it works for him. I mean, he's a million dollar seller, right? But that like, to me, like that doesn't really impress me too much. If your store does $2 million, but your, but your net profit was, you know, uh, $60,000. <laughs> off of your yeah. 2 million, that's, I'm sort of like, eh. Especially if you had to travel across the country to do that. Yeah, especially with like renting the U-Haul and all of the gas and the hotels. I wonder how he factored that in, if he even put those numbers in, because that definitely would eat profits away, but you wouldn't really think about that as a cost, but you should. And despite what people think, like, oh, you can write it off on your taxes. Y yes, but all that does is deduct from my taxable income. It doesn't give it to me for free. What repricing software do you use? and do you like it or do you even use them? Yeah, I use a Be Cool. It's, it's been invaluable to me, really. I mean, there's a lot more that I could do with it that I don't. I basically have a minimum set and a maximum set, and I set my own. Essentially, when it's all working right, the basis of it is is I will match the buy box as long as it's within my above my minimum. And I also have it set to where it doesn't drop over a certain percentage. Depends on how many ASINs you have, too, right? Like if I had maybe 30 ASINs or 10 or something, that'd be a lot more yeah, easy to manage true. than if you have, you know, multiple. And that's really where it comes in because like, for example, I've got an item that was selling for 17, but I just looked, I sold some today for 26, right? Because my repricer actually raised that price up. So I was like, man, I, I never would, I never ever would have caught it, right? Because yeah. I'm not looking at every ASIN all the time. What do you guys do with your listings when you're done selling them? Do you delete the whole thing out of your inventory? Yeah, yeah, I would always I would always delete. For some reason, I didn't want some new red flag thing pop up. For even though I know that doesn't really matter in the end. No, it, that literally selling, happened. Right? Yeah. I I had stuff I was selling like a year ago. I it was just I got it on a deal, sold through it, and I never deleted the listings. Like I would just leave that as inactive inventory. And I got um, like an IP on it just randomly, like a year later, I'm like, I'm not even selling this. But because I had the listing open, no inventory, nothing active, I got hit with a complaint. Yeah, that's, that's a really good good point. I, I've told myself once a month at the end of the month, I'm gonna clean up the, the ASINs that I don't have anymore, right? Yeah. Um, it's been like three months since I think I did the last one. But you're right. That's that's the biggest thing because that's happened to me several times. So like, yep. oh, either an IP complaint or a suspected IP complaint. And it's something I sold two of, you know, a year yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. But so yeah. many more and more brands are not wanting third party sellers to sell their their products. So something right. that I was selling easily, I kept it open, and now I'm getting hit with all this stuff. So I'm like, crap! I got to go through and delete everything that I'm not selling. And, and you got to be careful too, because if you delete something that's either one on its way or it's an FC transfer somewhere, but it shows as zero, mm -hmm. like you don't want to delete something that you have actively going in, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't want to delete something that could potentially come back either, because if you sell something and you delete the listing and then like a 
customer returns it or something, there could be an issue with that. Keep, keeping that nice and clean is is the idea. I think your uh, your safeguard, and if you accidentally delete something and you didn't realize there's FC transfers, at least it will show up on the unfulfillable inventory, right, or whatever category it is, and then you can just re-add it pretty easily. Regularly. I think that's happened to me a couple of times I th- and you have to like recreate the listing. I've had it been to where I can recreate it and then they add it. And then I've had it to where they're like, no, you have to have it all sent back and resend it in. Oh, really? And there could have, and this has been a while ago. So there could have yeah. been some other caveat. Yeah. If you've been around for a long time in Amazon, they don't give you any favors clearly. Right? No, <laughs> no, there's no, there's no uh, loyalty program for you. Nope, can't even get my money when I want it. Gonna <laughs> wait two weeks. It's not Burger King. You can't have it your way. Anyone have anything else? Are we good? I mean, I I could talk about it for for days. I do enjoy sharing about this topic. There's not even. a lot. Yeah, there's not a lot of people you can talk about it with. Like no one in my personal life would understand. I like hearing how people do things and sharing my somebody started my pros and cons and what I wouldn't do and do again, you know. Oh, yeah, and I've got all kinds of questions, you know, private labels, something I think is interesting, but you know, how do you come up with your idea? What do you do? Who do you get to make it? All that kind of stuff. I'm like yeah. bundles, bundles is something I'm looking at. How did like this come about? You know, it was like I don't even couldn't even imagine that when I started private label. Like, I'm not, I, I don't draw. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's just. There's all kinds of questions, you know, like I don't know, b- bundles I think are going to be good. But then I'm like, it's just, I think the, the hardest part for me is that I'm so in the mode of what I'm doing and it's working mm-hmm. to start to learn something else. I'm like, you have to take time away from what you're currently doing. And so you get sort of in that, like, it's hard to take time away from what's working to put it into something, even if it could potentially be, you know, better. There's just some- only so many hours in a day. That's like my biggest struggle. Having the energy after like the normal stuff is done. But like people will ask me like, why do you still teach uh, New York State retirement? Like that's the answer. <laughs> I've had to tell myself like during the week, six o'clock, I'm going to be done, right? Because I start my regular job at six and then I was working, boxing up stuff and everything until like eight, nine, 10, 11 o'clock at night every night. And I'm like, I still have like a wife and a kid that's here, right? Yeah, like we would hard. take a break and we would eat dinner, we eat dinner together every night, but I'm like, I don't want to just come home and be on the computer all the time. And even though it's working, it's writing for the family. So I was like, you know what? Six o'clock, I'm going to be done. Now, sometimes it runs to like 630 or something, but for the most part, I'm like, the stuff will be here tomorrow, right? Like That's where I'm struggling with having like three young kids who like want to play and do all the things. And I still need to feed them and clean them. I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't need to sleep. Like if I could pick one superpower no sleep so i could just stay up get so much done you don't you don't play the game of hey let's everybody get a poly bag okay (laughs) you get to play with stickers today i'm gonna time you see how many you can do (laughs) yeah see i mean you just need to roll it all together take it i'm too much of like a a a teaching person yeah it it would drive me nuts i'd just be like looking the whole time like my ocd would be like no no that's not right the sticker is tilted sideways you need to have it completely straight (laughs) <laughs> that, that's definitely hard but it's something like people who get employees right like i got a friend who does he did he cleared a million yesterday with re, or not yesterday last year retail arbitrage right shops nice. at mainly one to two stores but if you find something he has two people that are go shopping for him so he finds them and he'll, he'll send them out to get them right and then he has somebody that like boxes up his fbm for him and i'm like the the minute that like i pay you to box this up and you do a crap job of it or something happens and I get marked on my account, I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. man, you, know, you got to have some compassion. But it's like at the same time, you're like, I never would have made that mistake. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what's hard for me. Like, I'm always, if I want it done right, I'm just going to do it myself. It, it, I think it's just the Amazon platform that scares me with that. If it was my business, my website, I'll take a couple hits personally to train people. But when it's so delicate, like we talked about earlier, if you make a shipping mistake or if you do something like sending it off to Amazon, like everything's supposed to be in a two pack and you send everything in in a one pack or something. You I just talked that. about this in a video I made this week. There's little room for mistake, like a, such little room for mistake. Uh, it's You're walking on eggshells most of the time. And the worst part is when you're getting started, you almost have to be afraid not to make mistakes either, right? Like it's, it's a delicate balance of if you're going to get started in this, you just kind of have to move forward and just go but the reviews matter so you want to make sure especially when you don't have any yet that you're getting five star reviews 
reviews are another, I mean, that's a whole nother thing, right? Yeah, we should I mean, do it. We should keep doing these. I think it would be so fun to do like a live stream, like stream yeah. it live onto YouTube oh, and yeah. stuff. And people like come in and comment. It'd be a lot yeah. of fun. We'll see if people are interested in that and join us in the conversation.